Hi, and welcome to another edition of MD Insights. I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Cristiano Quintini, who is the director of our liver transplant program in the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute uh, in Cleveland. Cristiano, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Connor, for having me. Oh, I'm delighted you could make it. Listen, just thought we'd start off by wh why did you pick transplant? Um, fascinating field uh, to me, but like, wh what brought you to transplantation, Cristiano? It's a very good question, Connor. So I did my uh, medical school in Italy, and um, early on, uh, in, uh, during my actually medical school as a third year, I started to do some research uh, in, at the University of Bologna. There was a very prominent uh, surgeon there doing a great job in the liver transplant field, and he had a fantastic team. So I felt as a medical student that was a great opportunity for me to um, start some research and uh, getting my feet wet with surgery in general. And, um, and, and then the field just really absorbed completely uh, my passion and uh, uh, I started to work more, uh, doing for organ procurement, uh, uh, started to scrub in transplants and complex liver resections, and I, I just fell in love. And um, afterwards, during my residency, I always tried to, to uh, work more and more, as much as I could in, in this field, and, and it's just something that uh, naturally progressed. Well, we're excited to have you here running a, a big and complicated program. You mentioned procurement as you were talking there, and I know one of your fields of interest has been around procurement and preservation. Uh, maybe you tell us a little bit about ex vivo perfusion of organs and, and how useful you think it is and where you think it might go as a field in the future. Absolutely. So as you know, uh, liver transplantation is an extremely effective uh, uh, treatment modality for patients that are affected by end-stage liver disease. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, the, the um, patients that are transplanted live 20, 30, 40 years with an absolutely uh, normal quality of life. And, and the life of, of a transplanted liver is basically um, almost equal to, to the life of a normal native organ. Um, so the, the limiting factor, what, what really keep us from saving uh, really um, uh, as many life as we would love to is the lack of available organs. Uh, so we have this very effective treatment option, but we don't have enough uh, organs that we can transplant to all the patients in need. So we've been, uh, uh, we've had actually a strong interest in our group and also around the world, uh, lots of resources invested to try to figure out on how we can uh, optimize those organs that we have available. Uh, the population is aging, uh, the population uh, is uh, more and more affected by obesity, and, um, and so the donor population. And uh, so the, the uh, ability to transplant ideal organs nowadays is basically uh, very, very remote. So we have to figure out ways to, to make the best out of those organs that we have figure out ways to optimize this uh, scarce resource. So one of the things we, that we can achieve uh, uh, this very important goal is by using a technology uh, that um, uh, revive the organ after the procurement phase, which is a very delicate uh, phase for the organ. Uh, the way we do transplant uh, and, and organ procurement uh, conventionally, uh, which is the same way for the past three, four decades, is placing the organ in a nice, uh, um, in a nice container with a cold preservation solution. And this is a very, um, very effective way for normal organs, but when it comes to organs that are somewhat uh, less than ideal, um, this process creates a lot of injury and many organs cannot be transplanted as a result. So our group, along with the three, four other groups around the world, have um, uh, placed a lot of emphasis on this technology called the uh, ex vivo or ex situ organ preservation, where basically we take the organ and instead of placing it in a deep coma on, on this ice container, we place the, the organ in a device that circulates uh, uh, blood, ox oxygen, nutrients, medications, and virtually maintains the organ in a very active uh, state, almost, uh, you know, just as in, is a, is in a normal uh, body. And uh, this has shown very promising results. We're doing trials uh, around the world to make sure that this technology is safe and effective. The preliminary results are, are I would say, exceptionally promising. 
And we've done, we've used this technology now uh, 29 times at our program and uh, with excellent outcomes. And uh, so we will continue to push the limit because we really believe that with this technology, we can rescue many um, untransplantable organs. What currently we believe are untransplantable, I believe we can trans successfully transplant them in our patients. Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating. And looking at them, seeing them produce bile. Uh, and then I guess some of the other side of it is the recipient side because they get less of the reperfusion injury. And these often very borderline recipients, it's a, a less bumpy course as you reperfuse the liver intraoperatively. Absolutely. As you alluded to, one of the most uh, a delicate phase of a transplant operation is when we um, when we reestablish re the blood supply to the transplanted organs. So this is a very uh, difficult uh, um, phase for the for the recipient because there is a lot of uh, the blood pressure goes very low, the the heart uh, is subjected to a lot of stress, and what one of the um, benefit of this technology they were working on is the fact that. Uh, uh, because the organ doesn't really go from a from a deep freezing state into uh, to a normal situation, but it goes more from a near physiologic situation to being again in a in a human being perfused. Uh, there, there's there's a lot of evidence showing that uh, uh, this machine makes this uh, reperfusion phase, this uh, reperfusion syndrome, as we call it, much more benign, and uh, and it seems like that the the heart and the lungs are under a lot of lot less stress after reperfusion compared to the um, to the normal standard of care. So this is just another uh, uh, benefit, another benefit. Of this Yeah, yeah. So maybe recipient indications as well as borderline organs. So obviously many of these recipients they're critically ill when they come in. So maybe you tell us a little bit about how you structure the partnership with uh, transplant hepatology and medical intensive liver units or ICUs in many places that mightn't have particularly a liver unit, but that's obviously a critical part of how you approach these patients and decide the right ones and keep them healthy enough while they wait for a transplant. Uh, yes, that's an excellent point. Uh, a lot of the success after transplant uh, uh, comes from uh, optimizing these uh, extremely sick uh, individuals before the transplant, so making sure that uh, uh, nutrition uh, is optimized, making sure that the neurological uh, status is optimized, that that uh, residual liver function that those patients have is optimized, that the heart condition is uh, kept at its best. Kidney function is another uh, extremely important factor going into a, a complex operation like a transplant. So that's exactly uh, what the, the MILU, which is our medical liver intensive care unit, it's a, it's a a facility that is dedicated along with a dedicated group of people to care for this uh, uh, very sick uh, patients uh, presenting with uh, uh, the, the late stage of uh, end stage organ disease, uh, in, in this case the liver. So we have a multidisciplinary uh, gr group of people that include uh, uh, intensivists, experts in uh, respiratory care, in uh, liver care, our hepatologists with a strong background in uh, critically ill um, liver patients. So they all join forces and, uh, and the idea is to really keep these patients in their absolute best possible conditions prior to a major operation. And, and this has been shown to be a game changer and something that really uh, makes a huge dif difference in terms of outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with all of that, there's a number of patients who, who fail and I, I know you and your team have built a huge practice in, in many of these transplants that are getting um, or not able to be done elsewhere, whether they're redo transplants or whether they're multi-organ transplants. Uh, maybe tell us about some of those complexities. Yes, there is a, there is a patient population that is a very high risk of failing during or after a liver transplant. Uh, you mentioned some of these patients. So patients that have already uh, received a transplant, um, the operation is uh, much more complex because of the adhesions and the nature of the failure of the liver. Is These operations are um, characterized by huge blood losses and, and uh, incredible technical complexity. So we've developed an interest for, for uh, this type of um, patients and we're receiving a lot of, of uh, patients from all over the country that uh, do come with uh, uh, 
uh, this type of situation. Uh, the other um, interest that we've developed in, over the course of, of the last uh, uh, seven to eight years is um, those patients that do have not just liver failure, but also uh, heart conditions, whether it's a, a bad coronary artery disease or the need of, of valves are failing uh, or any other uh, complex cardiac uh, issue. So what we've done is we integrated our liver transplant program very closely with our world-class um, um, cardiology and, and cardiac care team. Uh, we teamed up to, to create this program where we uh, optimize, again, patient pre-transplant, but also during surgery and soon after surgery, we place this patient in a special um, care path that uh, has shown to be very, very beneficial for the overall um, inclusion of these patients that, that traditionally have been turned down and also uh, optimization and uh, ensuring a good outcome after transplant. And, um, and we've published very good results on, uh, along these lines. And, uh, and uh, this is another patient population that we're very, very happy to, to, to care for. And, um, and also another interesting, uh, very interesting uh, field that we're exploring more and more is the uh, patients that they do present with the combined uh, uh, lung failure and liver failure. So these very complex uh, cardiac and lung patients, uh, um, we've been working very closely and, and very well with our uh, cardiothoracic teams. Yeah, and um, you've even partnered with us doing inflammatory bowel disease every now and again, these patients presenting with acute uh, colitis and, uh, and liver disease and liver failure. And so sometimes, so sometimes they're simultaneous and then sometimes you'll do them as stage procedures 12 or 24 hours later or, or a little bit more maybe. Exactly. Uh, we do that. Uh, we learn that uh, uh, by caring for these very complex patients. That sometimes, if you stage uh, um, two very complex procedures, like can be intervening in the bowel, or uh, or uh, adding a kidney transplant, or uh, adding any other complex operation uh, to this already critically ill uh, population, uh, we learn that if you stage the procedure in uh, in two uh, stages that the patient tolerates much better the stress of the surgery and potential complications. And, uh, and um, so is, is um, uh, gaining that kind of experience in uh, how to deal with this uh, uh, complex uh, situation, also how to work with other teams, as you, as you alluded to, because uh, uh, these are, are, are uh, surgeries and, and, and efforts that involve uh, uh, at times 15, 20 different uh, uh, surgeons or medical professionals and, and um, nursing teams. And, uh, so also that coordination um, is very important. Now the success of transplantation and liver particularly uh, is meaning you can think about other populations of patients who you might normally do. Um, and I know there's the evolving and we have studies in a field of transplant oncology uh, and transplanting for cancer. Maybe you could tell listeners about that. A uh, big growing field. Uh, we uh, traditionally have uh, been very selective when it comes to transplanting patients that have uh, uh, cancer. Uh, this is because with the immunosuppression that we have to give after liver transplant, uh, there is this theoretical uh, risk that the cancer may come back. But as we understand better about cancer, as we develop the better treatment for cancer-related uh, uh, issues, we started to really push the limit uh, in liver transplantation. And uh, uh, we have developed a very successful uh, um, transplant oncology program in which we transplant uh, patients that have developed cholangiocarcinoma, uh, patients that have developed obviously uh, primary liver uh, cancer such as uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, a neuroendocrine tumor. And lately, which is uh, uh, I think a very, very promising field, even patients with unresectable metastatic uh, colon cancer to the liver. Um, we've started a, a trial. Uh, we enrolled several patients. Uh, results are very promising. And, and that's something also that we're, we're putting a lot of emphasis on. Yeah, and I, I think it comes with very careful structure and indications and uh, judicious selection. And, and it's fascinating to see. But just to emphasize for people that that's a very important part of, of how it gets structured. Um, so, so tell me, maybe, maybe in closing, talk a little bit about um, the field of tolerance and chimerism. Obviously, 
10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of discussion about um, patients who were coming off immunosuppression after liver transplantation and that the liver may be more tolerogenic than other organs. Uh, where is that field now and where do you think it's heading in the future? Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is what uh, uh, a dream is uh, definitely for a transplant surgeon, right? So to be able to do these uh, surgeries and being able to uh, avoid uh, uh, the complications that in the long term affect the patient uh, basically as a result of the immunosuppression. And um, the field has tried several, in several uh, waves and in several attempts to, to determine protocols that uh, could uh, allow the patient to be weaned off completely uh, from immunosuppression with mixed results. So what we have actually learned over the course of, of, the, of the past few decades is that uh, we can't treat every patient the same way. There are certain patients that are very uh, prone to accept their organ, and there are certain patients that will need immunosuppression for the rest of their lives. And so I think we're, uh, rather than chasing tolerance uh, at a broad level, I think we're becoming more and more um, knowledgeable about which patients are good patients for initiating a immunosuppression-free um, uh, regimen, uh, basically uh, taking off their immunosuppression medication. And, uh, and we selected patients, uh, absolutely there's a huge role in, uh, in, uh, in achieving just that, that dream. And so that, that's, that's a, a field also that is, a, that is in continuous evolution with new immunosuppressive drugs that are uh, placed in the market. So very exciting work on that arena as well. Maybe Cristiano, in closing, you talk about what you've done with uh, COVID and um, setting up a closed unit, because obviously a transplant immunosuppressed population is potentially at particular risk, long hospital stays, and uh, not that we see it getting transferred in hospital and we test people before they come in, but uh, tell us a little bit of the structure you've put behind um, getting the transplant program up and going again to the, um, you seem to be incredibly busy at the moment, but the safety that you're putting behind it for patients. Yes, we, we've been very fortunate uh, to work early on uh, in a very coordinated uh, fashion with other uh, programs in our institution, the lung, uh, the heart team, the kidney team. And we all together teamed up under the leadership of Dr. Charlie Miller, who's the uh, Transplant Enterprise Director. We really identified uh, pathways and, um, and uh, uh, put in place a very uh, complex and uh, infrastructure to mitigate the risks of uh, uh, COVID-19 on the pre-transplant uh, uh, patient population, which is obviously very fragile, but also on those patients that received uh, a transplant. And so we created a, a unit uh, in which there are special precautions uh, to uh, prevent and mitigate the risk of the infection. Uh, again, we have a unit uh, that takes care of uh, these patients in the pre-war, and also we have an ICU that has been dedicated um, to a uh, model in which we strive to have a COVID-free um, ICU care uh, that includes uh, extra measure to prevent uh, the transmission of the infection. And, and a very, uh, very tight protocol to monitor COVID in these patients. So uh, what this means from a practical perspective is that uh, number one, we've been able to even transplant patients recovering from, uh, from uh, acute uh, COVID infection. And we've been able to um, bridge patients that have, have had a COVID infection to a transplant and uh, so far to being quite successful in uh, caring for those transplant recipients that have acquired a COVID infection and uh, needed a special care. So I think we've been able to maintain uh, um, very actively access to transplantation, which is again, at the end of the day, is the best uh, uh, thing we can do for our patient. And, and as you mentioned, we've been very busy and, and uh, uh, with um, so far uh, great outcomes uh, in the, in the post-operative uh, phase of these patients. Well, Cristiano, thank you. Uh, congratulations for all you and your team have done. I always think with transplantation, well, at the clinic, obviously, we focus on being a team of teams, but nowhere is that more obvious uh, than in the field of transplantation. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. It was my pleasure, Connor. Thank you so much for having me.